almost always when I ask this question, there's only like two answers. The answer is maybe it has the information, but maybe it's not causally involved, right? Maybe there's information in there that discriminates chairs from cars and shoes and whatever else, but maybe that's a byproduct. Maybe we don't read it out. Maybe when you're perceiving shoes and chairs, you're not using that part of your brain. In fact, I've already presented you information that suggests that's the case. From the case of um, patients with prosopagnosia. Remember this dude whose lesion looks a lot like my FFA, right? And remember that not only is he very prosopagnosic, he can't recognize faces, but crucially, he's absolutely normal at object recognition. That already suggests that you don't need your FFA to recognize objects. If that's true, it suggests that whatever pattern information we scientists can read out of the FFA about things that aren't faces may not be used by that brain, may not be necessary for that brain to dis discriminate those categories. Make sense? OK, so we already have some evidence, but I'm going to show you some stronger evidence. OK, we're going to do a direct test. So a couple years ago, I got um, I got a, a phone call from a friend of mine who said, I have collaborators in Japan who have put electrodes all over the bottom of this patient. Uh, the neurosurgeon has put electrodes all over the bottom of this patient's brain to map them out before surgery. And my collaborators will be showing them some stimuli and stimulating their brain. You want to collaborate? It's like, yes. <laughs> uh, so we had them use, present stimuli of different kinds find their face selective response. The patient had electrodes all up and down here and here. Okay? Uh, and that patient, um, I think I mentioned this briefly. I, I mentioned this in one of my previous slides. When they, um, when they stimulate that patient right on top of the face selective regions, they disrupt face processing. I also showed you the video from another lab where the guy said, oh, your face metamorphosed. Right? So that was a way of doing a causal test, stimulating that part of the brain. And those causal tests showed that the fusiform face area is causally involved in face recognition. OK, so that part we've already done. The key question now is, is it causally involved in perception of things that aren't faces? As suggested by Haxby's data, there's pattern information there. If it's used, then if we stimulate that region, it might mess up his, the uh, patient's perception of things that aren't faces. Got it? OK, so I'm going to show you a video very short video clip of what happens when this patient is stimulated in that region. Uh, and we're going to look at both what happens when this person is looking at faces and when they're looking at non-faces. OK, so he's looking at a face and getting zapped. And he says, your face completely changed. Hair isn't defective. Such a good subject. One more time. He's getting stimulated. You can see it over there. He doesn't know about the face area. He doesn't know where he's being stimulated. He's just asked to report what he sees. Okay, so now we're showing him a box. We're asking, does stimulation of the fusiform face area affect the perception of things that aren't faces? This is a key causal test. He says, No change. Uh, 
eyes. This is a kanji character on a card. It's hard to see, but he's looking at a kanji. One more time. Okay, you get the idea. Where are we now? What about Haxby's claim that that region that was just stimulated in this guy contains information about things that aren't faces? Is that information doing any work for the subject? Or is it what they say, epiphenomenal? That means it's there, but it's not doing any causal work. What do you think? But the causal work it's doing is on face perception, not object perception. Notice he doesn't say the shape of the box changed, the box became round, or you know, whatever. He sees a face on top, right? So I think, I think I won. I think, yes, there's information in there in the pattern of response that differentiates chairs and cars and whatever else crappy little weak but barely detectable information. But I don't think we're reading it out. I think when we look at objects, we're, we're getting that information from other parts of the brain. We're not using that information there. If we were, then if you stuck a big, huge signal in there by activating those neurons, surely it would distort your percept of the object. Instead, it pastes a face on top of it. That's what it sounds like. I wish I had been there and, and able to kind of query him Further, what I would have asked is, OK, does a, does a box stay exactly the same and you just see a face on top of it, or does a box turn into a face? That's actually the critical question. He wasn't asked exactly that, but from what he said, and there's you know, an hour of video, and this was repeated many times. It had the same thing happen every time. Um, it seems pretty clear that the shape of the thing doesn't change. He just sees a face on top, which is my, what my hypothesis predicts. Right? OK, all right. Um, these things never end. So I think that's pretty strong, compelling evidence. But um, you, know, you, you should think about, OK, if you were Jim Haxby, what would you say next? Right?